Okay, I think we'll get started. Um, thanks everyone for joining. It is Wireless Friday. I'm excited about it. I get to do this once a month on the fourth Friday of every month. And uh, today's topic I'm one kind of excited about. Uh, so how, you know, I, I kind of work with uh, some of my peers to come up with what the topic should be and, and uh, realize that there's just a bunch of things that are kind of uh, rattling around in our heads that really maybe we only know or we're only very familiar with because we work here and it's not because things are, you know, secret or trying to kept confidential, just because um, there's just a lot of information out there and sometimes it's hard to find. So I, I asked around a couple of my friends, uh, I caught them, I caught them, caught them insiders uh, and said, hey, uh, do you have a, a tip that you think that, uh, that, that we might want to share? And I've got a bunch of tips that we're going to share today, and I'm, I'm kind of excited about that. So uh, we're using WebEx Event Center. Uh, if you are not familiar with WebEx Event Center, it, it looks a little bit different than a standard WebEx meeting. Uh, but if you want to uh, have some technical support, the best way to do that is to use the chat button. Uh, so that uh, chat button kind of looks like a little speech bubble. It's not the best place to ask questions. If you have questions about the content, uh, or if you have questions for uh, the presenter or any of the panelists, uh, there is a question mark button that kind of looks like uh, that button there on the slide. It says Q&A under it. Uh, you can ask that Q&A. There are uh, a little over a dozen panelists, which Thank you to all of my colleagues who have uh, volunteered their time, um, maybe volunteered their time uh, to, uh, to, to help answer questions. And again, many of them are going to be uh, presenters here today. There is another button that I wanted to call your attention to. Just um, on the right-hand side, underneath uh, all of the panelists, there's a little button that looks like a little bullhorn. If you click on that, uh, you can actually kind of tell me how things are going on your end. Uh, if you agree with someone, say yes. If you don't agree, say no. Uh, if you think it's great, maybe give an applause or some laughter. I'd love to give some, uh, you know, uh, kind of feedback. It's a great way to let us know in real time uh, what you think. And Call me. After, after the event, um, you will be directed to a poll. And we want to get all fives. Frankly, I know that, I mean, before my job here at Cisco, I'm like, I never give fives. Um, just like out of, like, you really have to go above and beyond. But really, if you can see and hear well, um, please give us a five. Um, if the content met your expectations, give us a five. It was clear and concise. Please give us a five. Don't give me a five just because I'm like, give me a five. Uh, if we didn't earn a five, let, let us know how we did, but I'd really love to know what would have earned a five. And if you have any specific questions about uh, what we learned here or uh, have some ideas for future sessions, please uh, you know, add those to the, uh, to the poll at the end. And, and with that, let's just get right into it. Um, I, I've, I have 15 tips. Now, when I asked around to my peers, there were a, a hundreds of great things that we could have passed on. But you know, whether or not that would be uh, kind of useful and and uh, digestible uh, was was up for uh, up for debate. So what I did was I, I I separated things out into five different categories, and I picked my top three favorite in each one of those categories. And I'm going to have my peers actually present each and every one of them. The very first one comes from J.D. Dorian. He is an enterprise networking PSS. What is that? It's a, that's just the fancy. We call it a product sales specialist. It's what I do. Uh, I'm, so I'm, just, I'm a subject matter expert. We call that a PSS. We also have on here a number of consulting systems engineers. So if you see that acronym, that's what that means. And um, J.D. unfortunately can't make it today. He was ill. He called me this morning. He felt pretty bad. But he wanted to talk about site surveys and the importance to do a site survey. And uh, his customers tend to be very large customers. But even very large customers fall into the same um, kind of marketing hype sometimes that, hey, you don't need to do a site survey. Uh, and so they, they sometimes don't. And later on, it causes problems. And so uh, what he wanted to do is like, hey, you know what? Um, a site survey that might have been like a site survey 10 years ago or even five years ago is way different than the site survey today. 
Uh, and, and, and just knowing, even if you did something just on paper or there's software products that, uh, that help you with that, uh, to help you understand where an access point should go and how high up the, off the ground and looking at obstructions. And then, you know, following the installation, do a, a post-validation survey. Um, that tends to be more along the lines of what, uh, what kind of survey is done today. But understand if you don't do a survey, you could have uh, results associated with, you know, just, uh, I think his term was like maybe garbage in, garbage out. Maybe that was my term, but uh, uh, not to say that it will always be garbage, but uh, know before you go, because maybe a survey can help uh, uh, illuminate an issue that maybe you didn't expect. So that was JD's, uh, uh, that was JD's uh, uh, idea for a tip. I want to pass the ball now over to uh, 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 my colleague in Florida, Ken. Uh, Ken, uh, would you tell us who you are and share your tip? Sure. So I'm the baby of the bunch. If you guys uh, will hear, some of these guys have been here 10, 12 years. I've been here for about three months, and I came from a, a, another a wireless company. And I'm the PSS here in the state of Florida. I cover Florida as well as the Gulf states in Oklahoma and Arkansas. And my first tip really is the importance to, to having a control plane, a strategy for a control plane for your network. And it's more of a dirty little secret than it is a tip. And that dirty little secret is that wireless isn't always easy. Sometimes it's complex and sometimes it's very complex. In fact, in an ideal world, there would be an easy button for our networks. But the reality of it is, is that most of our networks are complex. And managing each network element, each AP, individually um, is costly, and it can also be prone to mistakes. And so the more complex the environment, the more you need a control plane, in this case, a, a wireless LAN controller. In fact, when you think about some of the things that go on the wireless LAN controller or attached to the wireless LAN controller, um, you think about the radius server, you know, regulating who and what joins your network and for how long, BYOD. All these things become really a function of your business. And so as the wireless becomes a function of your business and becomes more and more important, you want to make sure that your design is, uh, is enter enterprise ready, and that your environment is enterprise ready. And one of the things that's more important than anything in a lot of environments is security. Um, and when it comes down to a, a controller or a, a LAN-based or wireless-based controller, um, security is simply an applied policy in a controller-based environment. You know, you got many organizations that have to deal with regulatory requirements such as HIPAA, PCI, and other things, and it creates a challenge um, when there is no control. Uh, a controller gives you the opportunity and the flexibility to deploy your wireless environment or your LAN controller wherever you want. You can actually um, put it behind your firewall. You can put it in your data center. You can put it in a hosting environment. It doesn't matter, but it will allow you to check that little check mark off on your regulatory requirements that says um, I'm complying with HIPAA or PCI or whatever it is that um, that requirement is. And so um, it allows you to have a, a really secure network that will allow you to, you know, focus on other things other than security. So those are my two tips um, for why having a control plane is so important. Hey, thanks, thanks, Ken. I'm gonna now. Uh, pass it over to Bob, my colleague. Uh, Bob, what is your tip? Bob, I can't hear you. That is because you're muted. Bob, I'm going to unmute you, okay? All right. Oh, sorry about that, guys. Uh, yeah, sorry. My name's Rob Kuralski. I'm a CSE out of Connecticut, and I support New England and New York State. And I'm just going to take control real quick. On my slide? Yep, you're ready to go. All right. So this is a typical uh, Merkin access point. This is what most of our competitors ship. So you can see it comes with a fixed 2.4 gigahertz radio, 5 gigahertz radio, CPU, memory, and some network interfaces. And if you look at the 5 gigahertz radio, um, this is what our 2800s and 3800s ship with. So you can see we have a 5 gigahertz radio that has its own CPU, its own memory, and its very own DSP for voice and video applications. And then if you look at the 2.4 gigahertz, all right, 
our APs, the 2800 and 3800, ship with a what we call an XR radio, which is a Cisco innovation. No other um, AP manufacturer has this. And what that basically means is it's band unlocked, so it can assume the role of a 2.4 or 5 gigahertz radio. We also gave that radio its own CPU, memory, and DSP. We upped the gigahertz in the CPUs for the AP itself, and we also doubled the amount of RAM that's in the AP. And what this allows us to do is a lot of great features, uh, in particular application visibility and control, and it also future-proofs the AP for future enhancements uh, via software. Then we have our hardware, our hardware offload. So if any of you have heard of Clean Air, that is a hardware product. It's a spectrum analysis that runs on its own ASIC, and there's a few others in there as well. And for the network interfaces, we added a multi-gig port and an auxiliary uh, lag port as well. And that multi-gig, if you haven't heard of it in the past, that is actually a technology that allows you to get between 2.5 and 5 gigahertz of throughput through your existing uh, Cat5e cabling and above. So no, no reason to run additional cables if you're using multi-gig. That does require a switch. Other enhancements, so the macro and micro antennas, and those are primarily for use on the XOR radio. Um, so when this access point runs in dual 5 gigahertz radio mode, um, the fixed 5 gigahertz radio uses the macro, and the XOR radio uses the micro antennas. Extremely innovative, as, as most of you know in wireless, it's not, it's not normal that two radios would be able to run simultaneously right next to each other like that, but we made some excellent hardware advancements in that space. The other thing is the DART antenna uh, port, which is a smart antenna port, meaning that you can just plug an antenna into that, and it will understand what type of antenna it is and provision for it. So you can use that for location antennas or if you're doing uh, any type of stadium or high-density applications. And finally, our expansion port on the AP3800, and that allows for future enhancements. So it's a modular port, and this is the only modular access point on the market today. And all of these features and enhancements are delivered at a competitively priced access point. So these aren't vastly more expensive than our competitors, but they are, um, as you can see, fully loaded with many more resources, many more applications, and a lot more flexibility and versatility. Great. Good tip. Thank you, Bob. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, for the next tip, I'm going to pass it over to uh, my friend from Texas, Alejandro. Go ahead, Alejandro. Excellent. Thank you, Jason. Well, I'm also a PFS. I live in Dallas and uh, cover uh, basically Texas. And uh, what I wanted to share with you um, today is uh, HDX. HDX uh, stands for High Density Experience. And uh, please don't think of high density as exclusive of uh, stadiums or university classrooms. Also, in your environment, with increased number of uh, simultaneous applications, like uh, voice over Wi-Fi or video collaboration, you name it, critical applications that are very relevant to your business. Um, these are demanding very high throughput. And not only people is using these, but also things like cameras, sensors, RFID tags, or, or scanning guns. HDX effectively is an umbrella of different features and functionalities unique to the Cisco portfolio and are geared towards increasing the spectral efficiency of your network and increase the quality of experience using Wi-Fi. Um, the, the tip today uh, is that these features are very easy to enable and uh, to fine-tune in your controller interface. Uh, consider, for example, optimized roaming, the ability to constantly understand the client location and uh, very quickly correlate it with the nearest access point avoiding the sticky client issue. Consider as well um, Client Link 4.0, which provides uh, beamforming technology across all client users. And we have been using it for, for a number of years now in Cisco. We understand it very well. And regardless of whether the clients use 11A or B, G, N or AC, 
this uh, technology being forming will again track the location of the client devices and emphasize the transmission in, in their direction, allowing a higher quality session, allower, al allowing a very lower uh, noise environment that will run the sessions faster and therefore release radio resources more quickly, right? And will save also client battery life. Consider again uh, clean air. Clean air is a signature technology of uh, Cisco, unique to us, and um, it, it basically detects, locates, and mitigates the negative effects of interference. And now it's more important than ever because now we're using in the 11AC spectrum, right? This is basically five gigahertz spectrum, which is more susceptible to interference, right? So clean air uh, in in the in the HDX fashion has the ability to work on bonded channels. Not only the 20 megahertz channels, but also 40, 80, and uh, 160 megahertz, and, and basically dynamically steer the Wi-Fi stations away from the impacted uh, channels, impacted by by interference. These and more features work atop uh, the hardware platform that uh, we Robert presented a couple of minutes ago, right? And um, I, I'm basically providing every radio with, uh, within the access point with its own processor and memory. Uh, we're going to be able to effectively support these, um, uh, these features. Turbo performance is the way we call this uh, for HDX. And, uh, and this hardware platform is coupled with algorithms for packet queuing, scheduling, and forwarding that uh, scales very effectively to a high number of active clients. Yeah. So Thanks that's that. my that's my tip today, Jason. Thank you, Alejandro. I appreciate that. Sure. So uh, the next one, uh, I'm going to I'm going to give myself because I thought I had a good tip. Uh, Mobility Express is uh, kind of sounds a little marketing ish in, in that name, but it kind of plays to uh, what uh, what Ken was talking about earlier about really having a control plane strategy. And you know, control plane and wireless. Oftentimes we just think, oh, a wireless LAN controller, which is this hardware box, which sometimes um, limits uh, what we can do in terms of uh, deployment, uh, at least in terms of flexibility. Mobility Express is a feature on these new access points on the 2800s and the 3800s. Our Wave 2 access points have a built-in wireless LAN controller that will support up to 25 other access points. And they don't have to be 25 other Wave 2 access points. Any access point that's supported by the version of code that you're running, so uh, say you're running version 8.3, any access point that's supported by 8.3, 3500s, 3, 2600s, um, all of those access points would be supported uh, as this Mobility Express AP is operating as a wireless LAN controller, and it is totally manageable by Prime Infrastructure. So that is my tip. And um, uh, by, by way of introduction, for those of you who don't know, um, I've, I've been with Cisco for about 16 years, and um, I'm pleased to give you that tip. Okay, I'm going to pass it over now to Brad Kincaid. Brad, can you give us your tip? Yeah, thanks, Jason. You know, I, I don't have as uh, as long of a tenure as Cisco as Jason does. I've been here about three years. I've been doing nothing but wireless for close to 13 years now. So, yeah, it's a fun technology. So here's my tip, okay? So uh, sometimes I think about why on earth do we have networks to begin with? And there are a lot of answers to that question. But one of my favorites is that the network exists to deliver applications to end users and customers. So given that that is, to some people, the purpose of the network, my, my assertion is that there is no greater feature, a greater tip, contrary to what some of my colleagues on the call may say, since they have different tips, but turn on application visibility and control and use it. And so what am I talking about when I say application visibility and control? So Cisco, uh, for years and years, has perfected a, a deep packet inspection-based algorithm for fingerprinting about 1,400 applications through our NBAR technology, which is network-based application recognition. So that exists and has existed in our switches for a long time. It's also in, uh, in our wireless LAN controllers and now in our APs. And what it allows you to do is two principal things, visibility of applications and control. 
And that's really important in wireless networks. So first of all, I always recommend customers, hey, turn it on and then just use the visibility piece. Uh, so turn it on and look at what applications are using how much bandwidth in my environment. How many of those applications, what I characterize as business critical, and, and how many are maybe some things that we could do without. And then uh, take it one step further and start applying policy based on what's going on at layer seven. So for example, the first thing a lot of customers do is they, they prioritize real-time collaboration applications that are business critical in the environment and then look at applications that can be destructive to network performance in a shared medium, like those that use real-time streaming protocol uh, that are not, you know, so like the, uh, a certain kind of streaming media services, et cetera, that, that use a lot of duty cycle on the radio and, uh, and hog a lot of airtime for what would otherwise be business applications. So I always recommend that customers uh, turn on and take advantage of application visibility and control. Um, and uh, as Bob mentioned a couple minutes ago, with our new access points, we're actually dedicating uh, uh, CPU resources on the, on the access point so that you don't have to worry about performance implications at scale to take advantage of this, this great uh, technology, which, by the way, is very different than how some of our competitors do it because they're really just looking at what port number are you using, which isn't a very meaningful way to really look at applications and uh, sessions and flows within applications. Um, so I recommend you turn that on. Two places to find it. If you're running uh, 8.1 and beyond uh, in, the, in the new dashboard part of the wireless line controller GUI, you can click on the best practices link and it's right there up at the top, turn on the application visibility and control. Uh, otherwise, it's under uh, the wireless tab in the, in the classic controller GUI. And uh, in addition, uh, you can take advantage of application visibility control for your entire access layer, wired, wireless, and WAN using prime infrastructure. And that is my tip. Thank you, Brad. I appreciate that. That was a good one. Um, and, and you're right, it was at least better than mine. Uh, for the next tip, I'd like to pass it over to uh, Robert. Uh, Robert, uh, could you introduce yourself? And uh, the answer that you're probably not uh, to the question you're not answering me yet is, yes, I did get your slides, and they're ready to go. All right, great. So my name is Robert Rolak. I've been in Cisco for roughly about eight and a half, nine years. Started off in sales, moved into channels implementation where we built channels training content for uh, how to implement Cisco technologies with wireless and ICE. Then I moved into the TAC. I supported ICE for about four and a half years, ACS, AnyConnect. Uh, and then also now I move back over into the sales org, uh, and, and, and I'm on this side of the house again. So that's kind of my history. Uh, uh, what I would like to share as my tip is just how ICE can assist with secure guest access. Uh, so we can go ahead and jump to the next slide. And uh, the, the first thing that we'll think about uh, with ICE is visibility and context. So ICE really allows for any wireless environment, any wired environment to be able to show context. Context is huge because without it, we don't know what we're looking at. We can't secure what we can't see. We don't know what's, not, what's on our network. Uh, so specifically when it comes to guests, many organizations, many uh, 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 network managers want to know who, who are my guests, how long have they been in the environment, where do they connect from, what building are they located in, what, what branch are they located in, how do they connect. And that context that ICE provides when users are connecting to it uh, is a beautiful piece, a missing piece in the environment that we can add in when we use ICE specifically with guests along with wired and wireless environments. Next slide, please. So when we think about guests, uh, the beautiful thing is with ICE and guests, you have uh, several different options for uh, uh, deploying guests in your environment. One, the, the very, very easy way, kind of your coffee shop scenario where you have hotspot guest access. And this is allowing the guest user to come in, they get uh, splashed to a portal, portal completely customizable, whatever you want it to look like, uh, you have the ability to do that. Either they can input an access code or you can have it with no access code. They just accept an acceptable use policy and get access to the environment. Uh, the, the, the other, another way that we can use guests is with the simple self-registration. And this can be self-registration with sponsor approval or self-registration without sponsor approval. So this is a scenario where your guest comes in, they create their own guest account, so you don't have to have somebody that pre-creates that account. 
uh, they input whatever information you want to ask for, whether it just be email, email and mobile number, email, mobile number, social security number, birthday, eye color, um, favorite a restaurant, whatever information you want to ask for them, you can do that with ICE in the sponsor page. They input the info. Their information can be sent to a sponsor. The sponsor approves them, and they get Internet access. Or they don't have to have a sponsor approval. They input that information, and then you give them a basic Internet access. And then the last way is our role-based access. Uh, so this is where a sponsor will create a guest user beforehand. So you have your contractors. You have your um, uh, uh, uh Several, several, you know, the partners, you have different um, auditors, people that are coming into your environment, and you want to give them some sort of internal access or even just Internet access, but you know they're coming. So the sponsor has the ability to go into the sponsor portal, create a guest account, uh, give that information to the guest user via email, text message, or printing it out and delivering it to them. And then that guest user is able to connect to the environment with those credentials and have Internet-only access or full access depending on uh, what your uh, specifics are in terms of segmenting your environment. So this is, is just a beautiful uh, uh, addition to any wireless environment where you can have ICE uh, to, to provide extreme context, extreme visibility into your guest environment uh, and, and make sure that your guest environment is completely secure and completely segmented from the internal wireless environment. That's my tip for you all. Thanks. I appreciate that. Uh, Robert, uh, the next tip uh, comes uh, from Alejandro. Hey, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, uh, if, and I just wanted to very quickly share with you uh, something that I learned recently about our uh, access points, uh, the top of the line 2800 and the 3800. I'm very proud also to, to discuss big differentiators of these um, access points, namely what uh, Robert uh, presented before, the, uh, the increased processing power per radio and, and memory, uh, which is a, a great foundation. I, I mentioned to you Clean Air, which is another piece of uh, hardware that sits in the, in the circuitry uh, for interference management. We have a very unique uh, chipset as well, the Wi-Fi chipset in the access point. I just learned of an additional thing that we have in the in these access points uh, that is called the uh, trust anchor module, and um, the trust anchor module is basically very relevant because uh, in in today's era uh, we keep hearing about security breaches uh, and. Um, uh, and now with the advent of the Internet of Everything, more and more things are going to be connected to the network and more and more things are going to be exposed. Concerns of uh, malicious attacks on hardware and software, uh, as well as um, counterfeiting of uh, PCs or set of boxes, in any type of edge device is, uh, is, is uh, exposed. And, and Cisco is proactively adding in many of our products, I should say, not only in the access points, but, but of course, since we're talking about wireless, I need to say uh, we're adding a secure boot, a uh, secure unique device identity, and uh, many multiple uh, trust anchor uh, module technologies uh, into these access points. Um, the, the secure boot implementation provides uh, basically a secure boot of uh, signed image, and um, also anchors a root of trust into uh, the hardware components. The, this hardware, which is a chipset with uh, cryptographic functions and secure storage, uh, this, this uh, integrated circuit that starts the chain of trust can per perform um, both um, system critical functions, security functions, and proactively monitors the start of process and uh, of device, the access points, and shuts down if the process is uh, is tampered if, if we detect that the process is tampered, right? So very exciting, a new uh, piece of hardware that is embedded in the in the circuit of the access point, and um, and I think it's very important in, in this world of uh, a continuous uh, security exposures to know that we have added uh, this uh, this functionality into the access point. Thanks, so, Alejandro. That really is a, a, a good tip, and especially with all of the news about uh, all of these hardware hacks and uh, and uh, things that are going on for uh, for monitoring. It's good that there's some built-in security uh, in these products. Thanks for bringing that up. I'd like to uh, invite Bill Holton to speak. Bill. Hello. Hello. Hi. Thank you. 
Uh, do you uh, want to give me control or? Mm hmm. It is. You have control. Voila. All right. Uh, so uh, this is Bill Fulton, Wireless PSS here in Southern California. Uh, and I'm going to quickly take you through an oft overlooked feature of our wireless solution. And that is this uh, greatly simplified GUI dashboard that was originally presented in code version 8.1. So it's important to note you must have code version 8.1 or greater. Um, most of you in the session are likely familiar with uh, what you're seeing here. This is the traditional GUI. Uh, if you were in the Wireless Friday session last month and you saw a demo of this uh, from one of our colleagues as he walked through many of the tuning knobs that are available to you through this GUI. Uh, that session was also recorded, so if you'd like to view that, uh, you may do so by going to ciscofullbars.com. Uh, but up here uh, in the right-hand corner, uh, it's sort of cut off, but you see this uh, home button. Uh, and what that does is that takes you to uh, a very simplified GUI dashboard. Let's go. Move forward. There we go. Uh, uh, which there are three kind of primary uh, elements uh, over here on the left. No, there's network summary, uh, there's wireless dashboard, and best practices. Uh, on the network summary page, which you see here, uh, this presents you with some very useful information, uh, like uh, your wireless networks, uh, number of APs, active clients, rogues, interferers, etc. Uh, keep in mind, these are screenshots of a production controller. I took these last night. Uh, this controller is in production in our test facility in San Jose. So in case you were alarmed by the number of interferers, uh, that's, that's the reason why. The number of rogues and interferers is uh, rather exorbitant. <laughs> Uh, but the best part is uh, you have several of these uh, dash lists uh, available to you, a couple of which are visible on screen now. Uh, these can be added to your dashboard, taken out, presented in graphical fashion or in matrix fashion uh, to your heart's content. Uh, the best part is, though, the ability to drill down into uh, this information uh, presented here. For instance, if I choose a specific AP, uh, I can drill into it and discover a lot of useful information. Uh, general info as well as performance summary uh, information to the right there. Uh, and wow, at first glance, that's a ton of uh, channel utilization, but the reality is that's not too uncommon in the 2.4 gig uh, space. If you uh, saw that in the 5 gig space, then um, uh, that would be cause for alarm. Uh, but furthermore, you have some really great tools at your disposal, as you see there towards the uh, at uh, the bottom of the screen, uh, this is more of a scroll down. Uh, there's uh, RF troubleshooting capabilities, some other tools. And if I further drill down into uh, clients, uh, this kind of tab right here, uh, these are the clients associated to this specific AP that I, that I chose to drill into, uh, one of whom has a username, Joe Chang, as you see highlighted in gray here. Uh, and there's some really useful information here on uptime usage, OS, et cetera. Uh, but wait, uh, it gets even better if I click on uh, Joe Chang and, and drill down further on him. I get to some really great stuff like device type and performance kind of, uh, connectivity, uh, top applications, and, and so forth. And looks like Joe apparently uh, likes to hang out on Google a lot. Uh, I'm just going to breeze through the next couple of sleeve, uh, slides here through um, uh, the wireless dashboard uh, to show some great uh, high-level views you have ac access to, like AP and uh, client capability, signal strength, and signal quality. Uh, again, all of these you can drill into further and just get a variety of great information from this uh, very simple uh, GUI dashboard. Uh, but one of my best tools, uh, my most favorite tools here, uh, and I'm going to end on this, is uh, around wireless best practices. And this is really awesome because this gives wireless network operators the ability to implement the world's most feature-rich wireless network with just a few mouse clicks, taking advantage of what have been predefined best practices for, uh, call it three pillars here, infrastructure, security, uh, and RF management. In each of these uh, three pillars, you can expand even further uh, and get, uh, get to a ton of uh, features and functionality. Uh, and I've done so here uh, with RF management. I went ahead and expanded that. So you can see uh, a handful of the features and functionality that 
uh, are shown here. Auto coverage hole, for instance, uh, uh, that's coverage hole detection, rather. Clean air, RRM. Uh, again, these are the most powerful wireless features and functionality, bar none, in the industry. And it's just a few mouse clicks away to implement. So very powerful stuff. Please don't overlook this tool. It's in our uh, WLC code version 8.1 or later. Back to you, Jason. Jason, we can't hear you. I don't know if you're talking. I was talking, and I was also going, hey, for our next tip, and thank you, Bill. I really appreciate that. Uh, I am not seeing Patrick, so uh, I think I'm going to give Patrick's uh, tip for him. Unless Patrick... All right. So uh, I'm going to give Patrick's tip for him. Uh, Patrick Kirk is a CSE. He's a, a CCIE uh, speaker at... Um, at Cisco Live, and one of the tips that he had was that um, not only his session, which uh, Patrick presented last month at uh, you know, for Wireless Friday, and I thought it was a great session. Um, you can uh, you can check it out on the recording uh, uh, later on if you if you missed it. However, he did an even better session at Cisco Live last year. Uh, it was a two-hour session on. Uh, building a highly available wireless network. That two-hour session is available to you, video, content. Uh, just simply go to Cisco Live, uh, this, the main Cisco Live website, and you can, uh, you can have access to uh, all of that great content. So if you were not able to, uh, to, to uh, attend Cisco Live, all you have to do is create an account, and you'll be able to see all that great content. Uh, I'd like to also now pass it over to uh, Ben Edwards, who is a CSE on my team. Ben? Ben, ben is muted. Ben, I'm going to unmute you. Thank you. Ben, I had here. muted myself on my phone, but not on the WebEx. Yeah, that's um, gotcha. If you want to pass me the ball as well. My name is Ben Edwards. I am a Enterprise Networking CSE in California. I've been working with Cisco for the last five years. And uh, the first tip that I'd like to share is being able to utilize other resources out there that aren't Cisco.com. Uh, so for example, uh, a lot of our product development teams are utilizing uh, YouTube. So being able to watch a video about how Cisco ICE can help um, manage your security network and how you can get that uh, control and how you can um, set up different types of features and functionalities all in a video that the product team has put together for you to show you how to configure everything. Um, as well as Cisco.com's main channel, which has playlists, playlists that are separated by the type of architecture that you're looking at. So for example, I put up one here for Enterprise Networks and mobility, since that's what we're talking about here today. And uh, there's a lot of really good videos, and the great thing about these videos is that they're not very long. They're three to five minutes, and you get the ability to digest something simply to understand a new feature or how something works or how to configure something. Um, and I know I still use these uh, on a sometimes daily but most often weekly basis, just to refresh on something or to share this with uh, my team. The next tip that I had, because I think I have two in a row. Am I right, Jason? You're right. All right. Well, the next one is simply deciphering ROS uh, build numbers. So how to figure out what code version you're on and what that means to you. Um, and the first part of that is the train number, the build train. So, for example, 8.2 or 8.3, which is the latest release train. And this is, um, this is, these will be the first two numbers in your build. Uh, the second number is the three-digit candidate number. Uh, the first release of a build is always a .100, and then every time that our product team issues a maintenance release, it gets 
uh, 10 added to it. So for example, 8.2.110.0 is the first maintenance release for 8.2. Um, and we will simplify that internally and just say 8.2 MR1. Currently, we are on 8.2 MR5, which is 151 there. Uh, and then if we do have any um, last minute bug or security updates that can get out, uh, we will update the third number in the uh, three digit candidate number. And then if there is an interim build, um, so we had something that uh, needed to be specially released for a specific customer or it was worked on through TAC, then that fourth number will change as well. Uh, and if you ever are looking for, well, which release should I be on? Which release does what? What functionality uh, is added? Uh, the release notes will have the new features and functionalities. Uh, and then I'll also like to recommend um, another site that I've got up here. I've got two sites, actually. The first, they're both um, recommended build sites. So the first one is for our AeroS code trains. So this is what TAC recommends on what builds you should be running and why, um, for what deployments and if any bugs have affected them and have been fixed. So for example, the latest one, 8.3, this is a screenshot from, um, I believe last week. So we're on uh, 8.3 MR1, but that's been updated with a security bug fix after the fact, uh, which is the one that's listed there in that screenshot. Um, and the great thing is that you can get a link to that and go look at what was fixed and make sure that that's not going to affect your, affect your environment. Uh, and then the last link there is iOS XE. Um, we, if you're running a 3850 or 5760 and you're running the wireless LAN controller in it, uh, we do still have recommended builds for those as well. Hey, thanks, Ben. I really appreciate that. I'll make sure to include both those uh, links in a uh, follow-up email that'll go out to everybody. Excellent, excellent. So far, so good. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to ask Ken again to uh, talk about right to use licensing. Ken? Yep, hopefully you guys can hear me. Yep, we sure can. All right, very good. So this next tip is about right to use licensing, which is really a game changer. Um, the new controller implementations are more than just a matter of functionality. It really is about licensing and portability. In the past, traditional controllers were married the controller to an access point, or in most cases, a block of access points. For example, you know, you would need five access points to, you know, fill out your network, and you would have to make the decision to, buy, you know, purchase 10, 30, or even 50 when you only need five. And you would go through that process because you would think, well, if I buy 10 and I need 30 down the road, how do I handle it? And once you purchase it, it was married to that controller. You couldn't move it. You couldn't do anything with it. The Cisco One uh, has changed that concept. And with the Cisco One license, your licenses are perpetual and they're portable. Um, and, and this means actually a number of different things. First, having a control plane is really what matters, right? Not the type of controller. So now you can move your access points from controller to controller. You can actually upgrade your controller without uh, having the penalty of having your licenses stuck on a specific controller. You can actually make your access point of controller with you know, Cisco Mobility Express, as was mentioned before. And so your options in, in, in what you do with your licenses are virtually unlimited. Now, the second thing which is important is your incremental growth is more cost effective. We talked about how you can purchase one or two access points if that's all you really need. So now you basically purchase the licenses you need. Um, so you only have to pay what you need. So now you're, you're living in a, com a consumption-based environment as opposed to um, sort of a, a Costco-based environment where you buy as much as you can and hope you use it. And so that is actually more cost-effective for you and it's probably easier for you to talk to your IT department or to your CIO about, about growth. And, and the third thing that's important too is technology refresh. It's, it's actually simpler. Um, so because your license are portable, say for instance you had a, an older wireless lag controller and you want to upgrade because of more features or even more capacity, now all you have to do is go out and purchase that wireless LAN controller uh, without having the issues of losing those licenses and having to purchase more licenses. Now your licenses are portable. The same is true for um, your access points as well. 
And so when you think about the right to use being a game changer, it really allows you more flexibility in, in using your licenses the way you want. Um, and quite frankly, it, it's, it's something that um, it will benefit you guys um, as users as opposed to Cisco because it will give you the ability to, to move around more freely, um, keep your access points longer if you needed to, and only change the access points or the calls you actually need instead of having to do this forklift upgrade in the future. So that's my tip on right to use licenses, and um, back to you. Hey, thanks, Ken. I appreciate that. So good news, bad news. We are almost to the end, and uh, um, in the home stretch, I would like to uh, invite Ron Amenta to present the next tip. Thanks, Jason. Um, so this is Ron Amenta. I'm an enterprise sales specialist here out of Chicago. Started with um, Aeronet back in 1998, so uh, been around here in the wireless space for, for, for quite some time now. Um, so I guess in the good news segment of this, I'm going to talk about how to save you money. So if that helps everybody from a tips and tricks perspective, I'm going to give you some of the promotional information uh, that's available today. So Cisco clearly delivers a number of different promotions. You guys might be familiar with some of those. Those can change with product or change by fiscal year here as well. But some of the things that we've provided here are trade-in for older equipment. So, for example, perhaps from an AP standpoint, moving from 11N to 11AC Wave 2, where we are today. We also provide uh, credits here, promotions around uh, trade-in for competitive or competing product that you might have installed today to put in new Cisco Aeronet equipment. And then also we do some bundles. Uh, from an access layer perspective, two switches, five APs, or two switches, 10 APs, um, allow you to get some, some cost savings anywhere from, I would say, 15% uh, on up, depending on what your product mix is with, with those particular um, 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 access components. So um, we also do offer, as Jason has here at the bottom, the, the pure wireless bundle. So I kind of might position that a little bit as uh, um, we have around a volume play. Of course, you know, the more you pile on there, the, the better that, that number can get as we grow up with that deal. But what I was going to focus on here from a migration standpoint, kind of getting into what Ken had talked about there as well, and one of the more popular ones that we have going on today is a migration program that allows you to go not only into new hardware, but also into the Cisco One offering that Ken was talking about. So this migration offer, for uh, number one, provides you with this ability to get into the new hardware technology. So many customers today are working with the very, very popular 5508 wireless LAN controller, or perhaps the 2504 and a number of those. Uh, the 5508, for example, has been around now for going on about eight years. And we typically look for a product cycle here somewhere in the five to seven year range. And with the pace of change in wireless, it might be on the short end of that deal. But but again, very popular, been around for a while, but perhaps time to look at a refresh for those. As Ken had mentioned, those do have a node lock with those licenses. Actually, those licenses do belong you know, effectively to the box, if we will, uh, versus uh, the customer. So the next thing that that does for us, this promotional migration, um, is to get you into the new consumption model, and that is with, with Cisco One. So the Cisco One piece does come in different flavors. Uh, WAN, uh, data center, uh, advanced security, and of course the access piece that we're talking about here today. So we look at this in terms of a software suite, uh, some of which you may have components of, but some additional ones that you may not, that with this migration program gives you a very cost-effective way of getting into it. Again, those licenses then would be permanent and perpetual by maintaining the software support on those. And that, that license now belongs to you, the customer, versus being kind of tied to that box as historically we've had here at Cisco. Now this software um, is then available, the Cisco One Suite all by itself, just buying net new would be $350. With this migration program and putting you into the new hardware platform allows you to buy this Cisco One migration SKU at $200 if you do not own prime infrastructure. If you own prime infrastructure here as well today, um, that Cisco One migration cost, getting you into that software suite, is going to be $150. Just a standard net new AP price on a controller today is $200. So you can see that now we can put you into Cisco One and bring that price point down there to 150 
With that Cisco One Suite, some of the additional value that you might get out of it here potentially is one, now with Prime Infrastructure, we do provide Prime Assurance as part of that solution as well. So now we can see those things uh, like how this uh, network and your wireless infrastructure is being consumed, not only by number of devices, by, but by what applications that those users are, 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 are leveraging. Also, we provide ICE base. Um, so we talked about ICE and the guest access capabilities that exist here uh, today. Now this is available to you at 25 devices per license. So in a bigger network, you can see that that would add up likely to cover what you would need there from a guest access as well as from a standard access control solution here for you going forward. Also, it provides the CMX and MSE base licenses. So now we get that visibility into our network and allow us to do historical tracking of devices here within our network. See rogue and place see and place rogue access points, uh, any Wi-Fi device that we might have out there in our network. And then lastly, something that Cisco One does uh, provides here for us as well is ongoing innovation. So uh, Jason, I think kind of teeing up here some of what you're going to talk about too with this free one year of StealthWatch. Uh, something that was recently added here is five flows per Cisco One wireless uh, foundation license as well. So kind of give you a flavor of what we have there for network as a sensor through your wireless network going forward. So that's it for me in terms of what we have there for that Cisco One um, and new controller migration program. Hey, thanks, Ron. I really appreciate that. That's, uh, that is a really good tip. And uh, I'm going to close up the tips uh, with, uh, with just, um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about StealthWatch. And uh, I will give opportunities for everyone to ask questions. If you have a question that you would like to verbally ask, just on the right-hand side of the screen, uh, underneath the participants, you'll see a hand icon. Just go ahead and click on that hand icon, and I'll see this. I'm like raising your hand. And if you raise your hand, I will uh, I'll unmute you and call on you, and you can ask your question. We'll uh, try and go through some of the Q&A panelists, uh, Q&A uh, 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 questions that have already been answered or uh, there's something we want to talk about there. But what I want to do is I want to talk about um, StealthWatch. StealthWatch is uh, such a cool product. And um, for those of you who migrate to Cisco One or purchase or make an investment in Cisco One uh, as part of a promotional program that we've got going on right now, we include uh, a license for StealthWatch. Uh, complimentary for an entire year. And that gives you everything that you need, right? Because I was, you know, when I first saw that, I was pretty skeptical. I'm like, uh, so what else do they need? Do they need a $2,000 this or a $10,000 that? Well, no, really, all you need is capacity in uh, a virtual server environment, uh, whether it's NeSX or, or uh, a kernel virtual machine environment uh, on, on Linux. Um, all you got to do is download uh, what we call the flow collector, and the security management console through Cisco One. Uh, there's a, a process that will fulfill your license entitlement. You just apply the licenses to those two pieces, and you go to your controller, or you go to your new switch, your 3650 or 3850, that have uh, the application visibility uh, capability that, uh, that uh, my colleague Brad had talked about. Uh, and you just start watching, the system actually starts watching the flows. And uh, if you don't know much about StealthWatch, I will include a little two-minute video. I think it's, I it's actually two and a half minutes uh, that kind of gives you an idea of what it is and how powerful it is. Uh, for those of you who have already made an investment in Cisco One, it's quite possible you're already entitled to this. All you have to do is turn it on, and there's no uh, obligation beyond that. Uh, so with that, I have, um, in hopefully not too small of writing, included all of the tips from today. So uh, if you have any questions, uh, please do uh, raise your hand and I'll get, uh, I'll get you unmuted. Um, I should be able to see your hand being raised. Um, I don't know if anybody is um, brave enough to raise their hand and ask a question, but uh, we'll, we'll certainly try to be uh, gentle. <laughs> Uh, anyway, uh, panel, question for you guys. Um, are there any questions in the Q&A panel that would make sense to uh, kind of uh, um, add in here? Or maybe was there something that we missed? Oh, my panel's being quiet.
All right. Well, so that probably means that all of the questions have been answered and that... Uh, uh, would Stealth Watch replace WIPs? I think somebody might be in the process of answering that. But the answer oh. would be no. It's complementary in the overall scheme of um, security. Yeah, that is a really good question. You know, wireless IPS, uh, the, the, the capability that's built into our wireless LAN controllers and our access points act as uh, sensors while they're serving client devices. You know, the reason that we can do that is because of the technology that, um, that Bob talked about earlier, uh, that not all APs are created equal. And one of the, one of the interesting things that we can do is, uh, is, is be an air monitor uh, for over-the-air attacks, and, and that's uh, so. That's wireless ITS. What StealthWatch looks for is really about uh, kind of behavioral characteristics. Um, is there uh, a client device that is all of a sudden and maybe out of the blue starting to send a whole bunch of data to some random IP address out on the internet that is within a known range of hostile actors on the internet? Um, you may not know that. It may not be uh, uh, against your policy. It may be, you know, your firewall's letting it through because it's using uh, protocols that are allowed. Uh, but this behavior, though, that just all of a sudden and out of the blue, we're <laughs> starting to see a bunch of uh, a bunch of packets go to, to some random uh, thing out on the internet. Maybe that is alerting. So that's kind of what Stealth Watch looks at. So it looks at application behavior and and uh, and, and flow behavior. So. Um, Again, yeah, you're absolutely right, Bill. It's complimentary. Okay, we are getting to uh, the top of the hour again. I don't have any attendees with, uh, with raised hands. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just close this out. Um, I want to thank everyone for, uh, for joining today. Uh, I, I have a lot of fun getting prepared for Wireless Friday, and it uh, looks like a, another a well-attended event. So. Thank you so much for your time. We're going to be doing this again uh, in, uh, in just four weeks. April 28th uh, is going to be the next Wireless Friday. And uh, currently the topic is uh, going to be uh, something that Alejandro talked about earlier, which is uh, HDX, which is kind of short for high density experience and uh, 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 kind of the features and, and uh, capabilities that, uh, that are in HDX. So uh, that's, that's at least currently the... Uh, uh, unless, unless someone else has a, a much better idea, that's, that's what we're going to be presenting. So uh, with that, I'm going to close this out. Thank you again so much for your time, and have a great Wireless Friday and a great weekend. Bye-bye, everybody.